local, uh, you know, unity goes up and down the whole time. But I, I think you did have it a bit during the 1980s, and, um, and, and in maybe today you're seeing it in parts as well, but I, I'm not so sure about that. But the thing that interests me about this, of course, all nations have divisions, internal divisions, and it takes a crisis like a war to bring them out into sufficient confrontation with each other as to endanger the idea of the nation. But what strikes me from what you were just saying, in fact, about Afghanistan is that despite all of these divisions, no one to my knowledge, and this is an argument that has been made by others, among the various factions actually advocates the partitioning or splitting up of the country. It's only certain foreigners who do that. And so there's perhaps not despite the divisions, perhaps not despite the great mobility of the society, but maybe precisely because of it, there seems to be such a strong sense of, at the end of the day, being Afghan. Uh, I mean, everything is linked to contacts and relationships amongst themselves. Um, when, you're, when you go to different parts of the country, but in, and particularly, again, during the 80s, uh, lesser degree today, you would be handed from group to group or individual to individual by very sort of 19th century letters of introduction. And these letters of introduction might just be a scribbled note. Um, but it was all based on personal relationship, and you had it on and on. And so, in, in a sense, I, I always felt that I was incredibly privileged to be able to do this, because I was living with one foot in the 19th century and one foot in the 20th century, and now today in the 21st century. Um, but you did have this opportunity. And what, you know, when I talk to particularly Americans and Europeans today, I, I say, look, you know, the Afghans are an extraordinary people. I feel very comfortable with them. You feel equal. And you don't feel this when you're in Iran, and you don't feel this when you're in India and Pakistan. You always feel that there is a colonial element, uh, particularly with Pakistan and India, which is still exists uh, authority over someone else. In Afghanistan, people, you know, to be very cliche, look you in the eye, you are on very equal terms, whether you're an impoverished farmer or whether you're, you're, you're rich, there is respect, mutual respect. A lot of that perhaps is being undermined today, but it, that does happen. So I always felt as an outsider that I was, and, and I still feel uh, incredibly privileged to be part of this. Well, thank you, Jason. I just um, thought, um, you know, the concern of the day in capitals like Washington and London is what's going to happen when troops leave um, next year, I guess. Um, and what is not often brought up in public pronouncements anyway is how regional powers have already started or are trying to fill the gap in their own ways. Um, and I, I'd like to ask you about India's role in all this. As we know, India has had in the past a very close relationship to Afghanistan in the pre-Taliban past, much of which, of course, had to do with her enmity with Pakistan. Um, that was reversed. Uh, India is again in Afghanistan in a very big way economically, infra large infrastructure projects, training. I mean, I remember seeing in Bombay a number of years ago uh, airline staff for Ariana being trained by Air India. Right. Um, they're being shuttled around the city in buses. Uh, and of course, large numbers of Indian workers and other professionals in the country. And it struck me when I was thinking about this, how oddly, in as it were, reoccupying her role in Afghanistan, and also in neighboring Iran to some degree, India seems to have reconstituted the borders of the Raj, of the Indian Empire, uh, because you know, her borders are now in Afghanistan and Iran, which makes Pakistan a kind of oddly internal problem for the country, as indeed it is uh, in so many ways. Could you speculate on that? It's a very Curzon-esque vision, by the way. I think in, if you look at it in virtual terms, uh, you could make that argument. Uh, India's interest in West Asia, what we would in the West would call the Eastern marches of the Middle East. So that's that's Central Asia or Turkmenistan, uh, Iran, Afghanistan. 
um, is certainly great. Uh, a number of different relationships with the differing states. Um, historic ties with Tajikistan that have dropped away in recent years, partly for just pure pragmatic reasons. Uh, ties with Iran that are alternate alternately uh, helpful and distinctly troublesome, depending on which interlocutor India or the Indian Ministry of External Affairs is dealing with at any one time. So, for example, the fact that a very significant proportion of India's vast imported energy needs, oil in this case, comes from Iran. Now, the Americans and various others, the EU too, want that to stop. The Indians have negotiated a kind of very Indian solution whereby they don't sign up to the sanctions, but they get a kind of waiver from the Americans particularly on the basis that they voluntarily drop their intake from Iran. At the same time, you have a stream of high-level Iranian ministers and diplomats coming through Delhi, trying to play on that old non-aligned um, uh, culturally anti-US or anti-Western uh, global vision within uh, both South Bloc and within the country more generally, looking um, backed by left-wing parties, backed by others. Um, so that's, that's very complicated in terms of the dealings with Iran. But with Afghanistan, I mean, what you say is absolutely right. The, the Indians have spent an enormous amount of money, well, relative to what the Americans are spending every day on their army, not a great deal, but I mean, it's still an awful lot of money, four, three or four billion dollars um, in Afghanistan over 10 years. They've built a few high profile things, like parliament. Um, they've done a fair amount of soft stuff too, as, you're, as you say. They're building up some of the security agreements that scare the hell out of the Pakistanis. Um, they famously have a series of consulates, nobody's quite sure how many, depends who you believe. Um, the, the, my question is, to, to take it to the point that you were taking it in terms of the sort of expanding Indian empire, I think is to, uh, is to exaggerate the actual effects on the ground. Um, because the, 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 the biggest weapon that India has in Afghanistan is Bollywood. You know, it's not the, the MEA. I mean, that's what people are, that's the main kind of buy-in for, uh, certainly if you look at the whole population. I mean, the northern groups, the Tajiks particularly, have got historic memories of how India helped Masood and others in the 90s, but, but particularly it's Bollywood. So that, that kind of soft power thing, uh, yeah, it works. I think, I think it has an impact. But I don't think when push comes to shove, it, it's really going to play the kind of role. It's going to be as strong. It's going to be as important uh, an agent in, in furthering Indian influence as Delhi hopes. Um, you know, if there's one thing, the Afghans are pragmatic. If you can talk about the Afghans, and you know, throughout not just the last decade, not just the last 30, 40 years. But throughout their history, you know, Afghans are a resource-tight uh, country, landlocked, so on and so forth, have played on their strategic position, certainly since they could no longer raid into the fertile areas of Shower Valley or across to the Indus or across to Delhi. Since that stopped, they've played on that strategic position to extract uh, a significant amount of whether it be cash or other benefits, from interested re regional or global powers. The moment that money dries up or there is somebody else who comes, al comes along who can also offer that, then the allegiance shifts. So I think you're right in terms of the broadening impact of Indian culture, um, but I think it's much more about, you know, Deepika Padukone or or Katrina Kaif or Shah Rukh Khan than it is about you know, pronouncements by the foreign minister or major aid budgets or indeed some now investments in you know, putative big iron ore 
extraction. Well, I've always thought that SRK was indeed India's weapon of mass destruction, far more <laughs> destructive in its own way than many others. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, I'm intrigued that you mentioned Curzon because, of course, one could see India's foreign policy as having inherited, despite itself, uh, problems bequeathed it by British uh, policy. And we know, for instance, that whether you're talking about the Durand line, right, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, or indeed the China, um, in honor of our, our speaker in the next uh, section, the China-India border and the problem of Tibet. These are all problems inherited from the period of the Raj. They were inherited perforce. Indians in independent India had to deal with these because the, the, the non-delineation of borders was a deliberate imperial policy, uh, which raises then the question of, which brings in the question of China immediately, right? Not only as far as borders are concerned uh, in the East, but in the West, um, the rivalry between India and China in Central Asia and in a place like Afghanistan in particular. I think you're right, it's much, uh, the idea of a new Indian, Indian empire is overplayed uh, precisely because of this form of competition. But I think what, what, what is interesting about even the attempt to think about India-China uh, competition in this part of the world, as in other places like Africa, is that um, it de-westernizes the whole um, issue. In other words, it's no longer about Washington or London, or it's about Beijing and Delhi. Uh, oddly, if I might be a bit provocative, it's only as it were the Islamist slash jihadi lot who tie Afghanistan back to the West. These are the agents of the West in that sense, because insofar as you see them as seeing, as, or as acknowledging their enemy to primarily the West, at least some of them, um, this is what actually ties Afghanistan back to that. They're not, they're not particularly keen on India either. No, but, <laughs> but they see India simply as a subsidiary arm of well, the... I, I remember being told about the uh, Hindu-Zionist Crusader Alliance by one of them, which is just sort of, you know, you can just bolt on as many particular enemies as you want. They love hyphens like Indians and Pakistanis like acronyms. I think we're way off the... Um, I mean, wait for the Americans to leave then see what happens, see how much practical uh, eff influence on the ground you know, the Chinese or the Indians are gonna actually be able to, to exert, and then we can talk about it. Or the much more important, I'd say, were, were Islamabad and, and Tehran. I mean, I think, you know, go, you know, you always drill down in Afghanistan when you're looking at the post-2014, what's gonna happen, let's, right, leaving the internal but the internals aside, if you look at the regional picture, you know, the internals articulate with the regional picture. The regional picture articulates with the, the big picture. Now, you know, the big differences from the 90s, I'd love to hear what Ed has to say about the, the, the similarities or otherwise with the 90s, but one of the things you don't have now is a collapsing superpower just yet. You don't have a Cold War in the same way. Um, you know, the, 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 there isn't that kind of global, global element, perhaps, so, in a sense, you're right, and it, it becomes a, 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 a supra-regional issue. But I think primarily the, the main, main agents locally, the main actors locally, are going to be those in Pakistan in their various forms and in Tehran in their equally opaque and multivalent forms. And uh, don't, don't forget the uh, Afghan government. No Afghan has recognized the Durand line, Yeah, which is still... Yeah, I mean, the Americans still see Peshawar as basically Afghan. I mean, th those nasty Sikhs took it. I mean, the, I, I, you can find uh, agendas, uh, diaries in Afghanistan with maps of Afghanistan, and very often the, the frontier goes to the Indus. Yes, by that token, India can claim the whole of Afghanistan as being once part of most of it of the Mughal Empire, and the Iranians can do the same. And bits, of the chi bits can be claimed by China as well, I'm sure. Well, the Afghans could claim Delhi. <laughs> Uh, Lucy, let's bring you in here. Your very interesting work. Um, uh, you know, I had occasion uh, some years ago when I was working in America 
of consulting with the Department of Defense um, on, it, in other words, looking at projects that were being brought up for funding. Uh, and there were a number of insane proposals on uh, various forms of, uh, you know, mapping of Afghan society, uh, not just physically, you know, through satellite mapping, but also of the Afghan sociology, you know, where tribes live, who's they were. I'm sure all of this is very useful, but of course it didn't take into account the, what I started out with, the sheer mobility of so much of Afghan society. Um, and this thought was reinforced when I, I uh, recently wrote a, a, a preface to a book of Taliban poetry, uh, which I'm sure you know by Alex Strick and Felix Kuhn. Uh, and when I was reading this stuff, it struck me that actually, in a way more solid and more uh, extensive and more continuous than the sociology of Afghanistan, who's where and et cetera, um, is the sentimental language of Afghanistan, right? Uh, as expressed, for instance, through poetry, uh, some of which, much of which will be very familiar to an Indian audience because it's in forms like the ghazal, right? In these interlinked cu couplets. And indeed, I came, I've come across a ghazal in which the suicide bomber is compared to a sati. Uh, so the Hindu traditional widow burning herself on the funeral pyre of her husband, which also suggests the, the rather extensive world of the imagination that figures as conservative as the Taliban uh, seem, at least among them, to entertain. I wonder if you could say something about uh, the world of sentiments and the world of emotions rather than the sociology of Afghanistan and what that might give us in the way of understanding a society in flux. Um, well, of course, I mean, the, the, the idea of the suicide bomber when this started happening in 2005, 2006 in Afghanistan, I mean, many Afghans said that this is, this is totally alien to their culture. Um, I think this is something that's really happened as people have become more radicalized as a response to the Western presence and the mistakes and the promises broken and so on. Um, I mean, of course, there's a tremendous, tremendous element I mean, there's both a warrior culture, but there's also an element of femininity about many of the, the mujahideen. Um, I think that the book you're talking about, there's also quite a lot of mujahideen poetry in there. It's not just Taliban poetry, so poetry going back to the 70s and 80s. Um, but going back to what Ed was saying about national unity, um, you know, national unity, I'm, I've been looking at this as has been a central interest of, um, of mine and, and something that, that I was writing about in my book because I think this is really what, what's lacking in the Western approach, the Western approach being very sort of hard and, and militaristic and unable to deal with the soft side, the political side, the political grievances. There's also, I think, something very sort of the, the lacking of the feminine in our approach to the war and in the narratives and particularly I find this in the media the Western media, the UK and the US, it's all about um, embedding uh, with the US military or the British military. And there's been a side of the narrative that I feel has been completely left out. And um, that, you know, that's the female side, the women's side. And I, as a, as a journalist myself, as a, as, a, as a woman, have found that it's been quite hard to get one's voice heard on this. And, and also, of course, therefore, to get the voice of the female 50% female of, of the population. Um, but on national unity, um, I mean, really, this was something that we have completely missed. Uh, I mean, it, great political scientist uh, Dan Rustle said that, you know, in order to have a transition to democracy, you first of all have to have a concept of national unity. And this was actually why I was very interested in, in this idea of, of the king, bringing back the king of Afghanistan uh, in 2001, 2002. Um, and that there was this peace plan, which in fact very few people have known about, that you know, in fact very pe few people really understand that there was an alternative to this war I if we had wanted to get rid of the Taliban and to have a new order um, through more arguably more legitimate internal means and having Afghans doing the, this themselves.
these various tribal groups, factional groups, even people within the Taliban who were willing to buy into this together. And, um, you know, my, I, I've explored this and I'm, I'm very interested in why the West chose to es effectively kick this plan into touch. I mean, this was just not considered, despite the fact that at the lawyer Jirga in the year 2002, when, which was the first stage of the democratization process, 900 out of 1,200 elders wanted the king. And um, that, you know, basically uh, a deal was therefore made um, with, with the, the warlords and the king was essentially very, very sidelined and humiliated. And I think the result is really, it's what we see today. It's, it's this kind of very masculine way of um, paying cash and rearming these regional chiefs, these regional, who've, well, gone back a lot about I saw the women challenging these warlords on the eve of this great meeting that was to decide to decide on the future structure of, of the state and, and uh, the democratic um, experiment and of course you know this has been sold in the UK and the US as a liberal peace that i.e. we're going there to protect the, the women to protect human rights and in fact even last night I had a conversation with somebody who was very un much under the impression that the reason that we are fighting in Afghanistan is to protect the likes of uh, Malala, who was um, shot at in Pakistan recently and, and flown into the UK for treatment because she was trying to defend women's right for education. My experience was that, in fact, this was actually nothing to do with uh, our um, engagement in Afghanistan because we effectively um, sold out who had been responsible for terrible atrocities uh, and allowed them not just to take up um, their, their positions, their, their military positions there to fund their militias, but then to allow them to progressively capture the state and take over the government. So I think, you know, we have to be very clear, is this, is this an inv intervention that's there uh, to protect human rights, women's rights and so on, or is it about something else? And I think, you know, it, it is, I, I'm not quite sure what it's about because Often I feel that it's just sowing chaos when in fact there, were, there was the possibility for order and national unity around the ex-king and with the tribal leaders and working with people who were within the Taliban military axis but yet who were willing to defect and to take their uh, military units and their people with them um, onto the side of the ex-king and onto the side of Abdul Haq. So I'm still at something of a loss to understand <laughs> what it's really about. Thanks. Uh, you know, given the fact that you're working with the AKDN, and I worked with them for six years in neighboring Tajikistan, um, which was at that time itself in the process, it's always a never-ending process, isn't it, of transition to democ democracy. And this sort of category, um, to my mind, came into play in the post-Soviet period, initially in, East, in Eastern Europe, of course, and the Caucasus and Central Asia. And in very few, if any, of those countries have we ever, have we actually seen the end of the transition, which should ask us, which should, I think, alert us to the problem of the category itself. And uh, you know, I want to ask each one of you on what you think of this idea of transition and what a transition might be. But beginning with you, Lucy, just because of the NGO, the importance that NGOs play in the idea of transition, especially post-Soviet transition, at least with my experience in Central Asia, it strikes me that despite all the good work that they do, some of them do, uh, there is a way in which some of these NGOs basically depoliticize or attempt to depoliticize society. Right? So you, you get foreign funding, you allow people who work with them to, as it were, extricate themselves from the, their own socioeconomic context. They are tied to others abroad. They are not part of a local economy. It completely disrupts a local economy. It's entirely about dependency, all right? And it's about achieving a kind of lifestyle that distances you from the corruptions and many real dangers of political life. But this sort of thing really cannot continue. 
All right. Surely there must be an engagement with the politics of a country by large numbers of people. Surely it should not be about depending on foreign funding, uh, you know, to create civil society. That, in this case, interestingly, is meant to actually prevent the politicization of people. Whereas in a traditional conception, civil society is integrally linked to politics. Right? It's the foyer for politics. Uh, uh, it makes politics possible. Here, you seem to be the drawing. Of course, this is a crude caricature on my part, but I think there is something to it. Uh, would you, with your experience, would you have anything to say about the role of the NGO as, in the post-Soviet period, the crucial building block for supposed civil society and democratization? I think with uh, civil society, you have to distinguish between foreign NGOs and local Afghan civil society. And I think that you know, with 2014 approaching and this idea of transition that we're all being told about, that the idea that you have foreign military forces withdrawing and handing over to Afghan security forces to essentially prop up the regime of President Karzai. I think the, the, great, the great difficulty is that Karzai is now essentially coming face to face with his past. He's coming face to face with reality, which is that over the last decade, Afghanistan has been a rentier state. And that is, in, in terms of that, this is because essentially he has not really had to play to his own audience. He's been having to show to the international community who've been funding him that he's meeting their objectives rather than meeting the objectives of his own people and um, Afghans themselves. And of course, I mean, we essentially handicapped him right at the word go uh, because, I mean, uh, there's also the argument as to whether Abdul Haq or Abd or Hamid Karzai were the more legitimate leader. And although Hab Abdul Haq wasn't seeking a position, uh, he was certainly someone who had a tremendous history um, during the jihad, during the 1980s, um, with vision of bringing people together and unity. Um, I think Karzai was not such a significant person, although his, his father was. But I think uh, you know the problem is going to be that because we have tried to build up a regime that uh, is a reflection of our own societies, a reflection of a sort of Western-style Weberian nation-state, instead of working with Afghan society and working with what is more legitimate to Afghans, which would be, and we've given lip service to the idea of jarga or lawyer jarga, but we have built nothing. We have not enabled the Afghans to build anything. And in fact, when I was I was there during the Taliban period, but I was also there for the first uh, six years of the war. Um, and I witnessed that even in terms of building a liberal democracy, there was no support for fledgling democratic parties. Everything was really about having reference points with strongmen. So what you had was you had Western military and NATO building up these provincial reconstruction teams in the regions. And you, you then had um, if, if, if I went to one of those and I took a local taxi and I asked the taxi driver what he felt about the Western military presence in a particular area, he would say, why are the, the Western people here supporting this particular warlord? He's kidnapping our children, he's expropriating property from the bazaar, and yet his, his men are guarding the perimeter fence of, of this Western um, army base. Why are you working with such people? And you know, this goes to the heart of, of questions of, of legitimacy. That you know, again, we haven't we've missold the war in our own countries uh, to our own public. Uh, so there's a lot of confusion. But actually, it's actually quite simple. We have made Faustian bargains with military strongmen in exchange for protection of our forces in those localities. But we've not allowed our military to bring security or to actually do their job. We've made these tremendous, tremendously poor trade-offs, which have affected the perception of the West uh, by Afghans and um, confused Afghans and made people wonder why we're spending so much money on the Western military. And one again, one has to ask, what is this all for? I mean, the US has spent a trillion dollars in Afghanistan. The UK will have spent 40 million pounds by 2015 just on this three-year, what well, it's five-year disaster in Helmand. Um, what will we leave behind? Because you know we haven't worked, uh, we haven't understood the local structures, the traditional structures. We've we've not even been interested. It's kind of dismissed even by some of the British government people I've heard 
saying um, when one says, you know, perhaps elections are not the most uh, appropriate way forward in a fragile country that is still struggling, that is still in conflict. I mean, in fact, when you read the academic literature, um, elections in a country like Afghanistan are positively dismissed as something that's highly inappropriate because they fossilize uh, power structures. And what they have done is they fossilized illegitimate power structures in Afghanistan because they have reaffirmed the power of these military stakeholders uh, who, in fact, in other contexts, might have been indicted for their war crimes. Uh, but, you know, and then, of course, these guys have bought in with um, international organized crime. And now we wonder why we have this essentially bit complex crisis of impunity and a very difficult situation for President Karzai, who's struggling to assert his legitimacy with these strong men. And of course now, unfortunately, uh, the, the corruption goes very close to his own back door and his own family. So I think what we're leaving behind is a, is a, is a very, very difficult situation. And this is, this is also partly why I, I wrote the book, because there was a window of opportunity back in 2001 and 2002, uh, during which we could have sidelined these people and had a more equitable political stru structure so that you didn't just have the Northern Alliance marching on Kabul and taking over all the power ministries and then taking over the, the sort of political structure and apparatus of the country and leaving the Pashtuns out in the cold. Um, of course, Pashtuns who comprise 40% uh, of the ethnic group at least. Um, but we, we had this very simplistic idea that anyone who's Pashtun must be Taliban. And anyone, we still have a simplistic idea, anyone who's anti-government force must be Taliban. You know, there's a very, um, I'd say, simplistic um, approach, particularly in the UK, sometimes in the media. I mean, of course, accepting The Guardian, which is a little bit more sophisticated in its reporting. But, you know, if you have another view, it's, it's very difficult to find anywhere in the me media uh, to put that, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to get those more nuance, nuanced um, aspects of, of the story out. And as a result, I think everyone is very confused. Well, let's move right to The Guardian in that case. Um, Jason, what do you think about well, the idea of transition to begin with and what the prospects of it might be? How are you defining transition would be my question. Well, in the way that everyone does, how, in the way that suits them best. In this case, I was talking about transition as the kind of uh, setting up through NGOs, but not only NGOs, of a civil society that makes possible uh, democratization of society. I'm not sure that has succeeded. Well, I mean, I'd say the whole thing rather differently, but that's partly because I, you know, my experience of working in Afghanistan as a reporter necessarily entailed a sort of different vision uh, in that, I mean, from I was there under the Taliban. I was there a, a lot uh, through the early years of the of the most recent part of the civil war, i.e., from 2001 on, and I've been going backwards and forwards ever since. Um, and I mean, to me, the, the the whole the transition element came quite late. I mean, I watched uh, as as what was originally a purely security. Um, based operation, I, the idea, why did the Americans go into Afghanistan in late 2001? Well, because that's where bin Laden's bases were, and the Taliban didn't look like they were going to hand him over. Uh, there, there were actually quite a lot of people within the CIA, um, I've spoken to them, who were sensitive to the concerns of non-Taliban Pashtun. Um, during the autumn of 2001, at the beginning, from about early October through to um, mid-September, after 9-11 attacks, the first thing that was tried was what was called the Southern Strategy. The CIA were trying to buy off the warlords. Um, this was very slow and wasn't showing a great deal of success. And by uh, mid-late October, there was a lot of talk in the American press particular articles talking about quagmire, this sort of thing, that meant that um, the Bush administration felt under very great pressure to move faster. And that's when they switched to what they called the Northern Strategy, which is basically bombing the front lines above Kabul. And that allowed the Northern Alliance into, to, into Kabul. Um, 
which wasn't meant to happen, actually. The CIA guys were on the ground were saying, don't, we don't want you to go into Kabul, and they went anyway. I mean, that's a sort of preamble. I mean, just to point out that at that stage, the sole focus of the operation was not, you know, oil or something, or strategic s extension, in projection into Central Asia. Or, it was about getting rid of what the, the, the source of the greatest traumatic experience that the Americans had had for 60 years. Subsequently, two things happened, which I think uh, set up the dynamic that Lucy has been speaking about, um, which is that on the one hand, uh, there was a sudden realization that you've got a country, it's a mess, there are various ways of dealing with it, it's very complicated, we don't know much about it, well I know, let's see if we can make it better, stabilize it. Um, and we need to keep public support behind us. How do you do that? Well, you construct something that's coming straight out of the kind of 90s experiences that you were talking about in Central Asia and Africa and elsewhere, which are those new style post-Cold War humanitarian interventions, nation building, entirely new concept. Um, that's what we're going to do. But um, the, the, the Bush administration said we weren't then said, well, that's what we're not going to do. So this is what I mean. There's this tension. There was a clear desire, okay, we're here now, we have to stabilize, we have to secure our interests here. At the same time, you have a visceral, uh, intellectual dislike for this, that objective, and you have Iraq, which arrives and then sucks out all the political attention and a lot of the resources. So what was a security, a pure security operation, becomes loaded with a whole series of cultural and ideological elements, liberating the Afghan women, um, creating democracy, bringing you know, a very heavily ideological superstructure, ideological load, without the resources to actually attempt, even if it were ever possible, to, to, to execute that. And it, within five years, you see the result, which is a lot of broken promises. The ground reality for most Afghans by 05, 06, particularly in those crucial areas in the south and the east, um, down from Khazni, through Kandahar, out into Helmand and on, uh, nothing much had changed. In fact, it had got much worse. It was violent. The government were rapacious. The police were bandits, etc., etc., etc. And the Taliban had a strategic opportunity which allowed them to come back. Um, they'd effected a strategic retreat to start with, and this was pretty much in the game plan, helped by Pakistan certainly, but not as much in my view as some would say, but, and then to come back. And once that had happened by 05, 06, and the Taliban had re-established a, a constituency, re-established local acquiescence, if not actual support, then it, you know, it was over. It was always gonna be over, and it was certainly gonna be over uh, once <coughs> it was generally decided that we are not going to resource this properly. This is always going to be the second war. Iraq's going to take priority. Even when Iraq's finished, we've all got too many financial problems to really deal with Afghanistan. Head for the exit, which is where we are now. So it was basically, what I'm saying is the transition was, the problem was attempting a transition without actually really understanding what that meant. And one of the saddest things I've seen was that clicking down of of objectives and of rhetoric. So whereas in 2004-05, I'd be sitting with British officials or American officials and they'd all be talking about you know, gender sensitization programs in the Afghan police, which is quite an ambitious project, it must be said, but anyway. Um, by 08, oh, by 07, 08, 09, they were all talking about recalibrating our objectives or how sometimes um, development issues are not necessarily entirely compatible with military objectives and strategic reality. And having built up this great ambitious project of turning Afghanistan into a mini Sweden, which as Lucy says is totally misled anyway, but having built this up, it was then taken bit by bit and then finally you end up where we are now, which is front page stories. And you know, the media are to blame to this to, to, to extent, my newspaper among many others. Um, front page stories this weekend of Prince Harry and how many Taliban he's shot <laughs> which is a hell of a long way from what we said we were actually it's not it's not a very long way from wh where we started that's exactly 
where we started 10 years ago. It wasn't Prince Harry, because he was only about 10, but it was, you know, how many Taliban have we shot? And that, that is genuinely a tragedy. Thank you very much. Edward, if I might ask briefly, and then we'll open up yeah, to yeah. your thoughts on this idea of transition. Um, well, one of the points I, I tried to make in Killing the Cranes was that in order to deal with Afghanistan from 2001 onwards, you had to pay attention to what's happened in the past, uh, the 80s, the 90s, and obviously actually going back to uh, William Dalrymple's book as well, 1842, 41, 42, and preferably even further back, but let's stick to the past 30 years. Um, what I found very interesting was that there were quite a few NGOs who had been operating for many years in Afghanistan, the Swedish Committee, uh, Aga Khan discreetly, Médecins Sans Frontières and others. They had built up an extraordinary amount of experience. They worked locally, they also dropped labels, they, they didn't use labels, they didn't say so-and-so is uh, a Talib or so-and-so is such a group. They said this is Muhammad or this is Ahmed, we can work with him because he represents this particular group. Now the message given before the bombing began the, uh, in, in, in October 7, 2001, was by Abdul Haq, by Masood, while, while he was still alive, was whatever you do, and this was the consistent message, also by the various experienced NGOs, is do not get involved in a war. Then the message after Masood was killed, and before Abdul Haq was killed, was whatever you do, do not bomb. Because if you bomb, you're going to turn against all these pro-Talib, and I use pro-Talib in inverted commas, um, they will not switch sides, as many were planning to do. Because they were getting actually fed up with the, the dominance of the Arabs, the dominance of the Pakistanis, as usual. And um, so there were a lot of possibilities, political possibilities there. The other message was, whatever you do in Afghanistan, do not throw money at it. Do not do anything short term. You have to look ahead 20, 30, 40 years, if you like. It's going to be a very, very slow process. Also, don't just impose everything from the West, from the outside. Now, the problem was that we allowed the generals to take over. And everything that's been done since in Afghanistan, from the Washington, from the, the London point of view, the Berlin, Paris even, uh, Brussels, was that uh, it was done through a security lens. And for me, the war in Afghanistan has been an utter disaster. I think, and this is what I think media, as, as a journalist as well, particularly the American media, are unwilling to say, is that these 3,000 odd coalition soldiers who've died, they've basically died for nothing. Because there's almost nothing left of the Soviet period. And I wonder, in 10 years time, will there be anything left of the coalition period from the military point of view. Um, so I think a lot of these NGOs, uh, as was pointed out as well, many were there for money, and also some are not NGOs because they are getting heavy, heavy government donor funding, which is all now disappearing, uh, and that will be the problem uh, in the, the years ahead. Um, and also there have been quite a few Afghans, these warlords, minister, minister, uh, people in the government, government officials, who've really thoroughly enriched themselves. I mean, the, one of the greatest property booms right now is in Dubai and Abu Dhabi with Afghans and in London and other places. Um, so I think the opportunities were there. And in many ways, there was this extraordinary arrogance amongst a lot of the military, particularly the senior level. It's, you're getting a different message now amongst younger officers who've actually worked on the ground. Um, and there were quite a few diplomats, Americans, European, who had this experience from the 80s and 90s, and they were also saying, go slow, be very careful, including quite a few CIA, but they were not listened to by Washington and London. And I put this question again and again and again to Americans, to Brits, why did the West intervene in Afghanistan? What is your reason? And I've received so many different, <laughs> different explanations, you can't believe. And I think there's a lot of confusion and there's a lack of coordination. I think many of the countries, the armies that are now supporting the 48 strong or 49 strong coalition force are there primarily to show, you know, solidarity with the Americans and the Brits. They're not particularly interested in Afghanistan. And, you know, the Germans, for example, went into Kunduz 
and which is quite quiet there. There were also Pashtun, transplanted Pashtun enclaves there. The moment they got there, uh, the war began in that area. So it's been disastrous. And, and I think the, the problem now, the challenge now is how can they move it away from the security lens and basically say, look, we have a development issue, but also an investment issue. It's, I mean, there are many Afghans with a lot of money. Um, and there are companies that might be, uh, in, you know, uh, inspired to invest in Afghanistan. Obviously, the Chinese are, the Indians are. Whether that will survive uh, the years ahead is another question. But that's the only way I think it's going to change. And it's not going to be according to our vision. Uh, it'll be a totally different Afghanistan. And the last point is the talks. You know, there's no Taliban per se. There are people who call themselves perhaps the Taliban. There's the Haqqani network. There's Hezbi Islami. There are many who are anti-occupation, which is the way it's been increasingly perceived, because they, their house was bombed. Perhaps their sister was uh, insulted or perceived to, to be insulted by some soldier at a checkpoint. The use of mercenaries, absolute disaster, rude, disrespectful. These things get around. And, and then also what happened in Bagram, in uh, Guantanamo, the way people were treated, many who were in innocent because they were fingered by ISI in Pakistan, they were fin fingered by other Afghans, spent three, four, five years in Guantanamo. You know, they came back and they have stories to tell. So all this is going around. Um, I think though, the, in the end though, the Afghan character, if it's not an occupied country, um, there is something you can do. And there are also, I think, many who support the, the armed opposition who basically want jobs, and they're tired of war. But you do, the more drone predators you have killing off these mid-level commanders, you're getting a younger group of Afghan, 20, 21, 22, who has no connection with his own country and doesn't mind dying. And as Lucy mentioned, you know, suicide bombings did not exist before. This was a, a foreign import. So I think this is basically the challenge, uh, but it's not going to happen according to our vision. It's got to be an Afghan vision, and, or let's say visions. And, uh, but I think in a sense, development can perhaps provide a key and won't be easy. Well, thank you. Let's open it up to the audience for questions in the time that's remaining. Um, questions for any one of our speakers. Yes, young lady right here, you. Hello. Uh, good. Yeah, my question is. Hello. Shout. By Taliban. So, what kind of relationship to they? Yeah, I think the question was what sort of relationship New Delhi can ex expect to have with Kabul, um, given that uh, you see two possibilities: one being Karzai there dependent on pro-Taliban warlords or uh, the Taliban themselves being in control of Kabul. Those are the two scenarios. Um, uh, I, think, I think the latter scenario is very unlikely. I don't think the Taliban are going to take Kabul in the near future. I mean, you know, it's always very risky to um, uh, foresee anything, as it were, in, in, in Afghanistan. But I, th I think the, at least in the short term, 
as far as we can see, say three, four, five years, it's going to be unlikely for the Taliban, uh, or difficult for the Taliban to take, take Kabul. Um, two main reasons for that. Um, one is that they still have enormous difficulty crossing the ethnic divide. So the Taliban uh, are still remain uh, largely limited, and uh, as Ed said, the Taliban is pretty broad spectrum, but um, largely dominant in the, in the Pashtun south e and east. I mean, there are all sorts of variations we won't go into, but that's more or less it. So they're going to have to cross and recruit heavily. Um, I mean, it'd be difficult to do. It's also, as long as there are 350,000 Afghan uh, uh, security forces, um, paid for largely by the Americans, then that is going to be a significant problem as well for the Taliban militarily. Um, the final point is we still don't know how many Americans are still going to be there. They could be as many as 30,000. They could probably only be five, ten maybe, but still. So it's actually the Taliban physically capturing Kabul and setting up a government I think is unlikely. Um, Karzai continuing and being dependent. Let's, let's just imagine an Afghan leader what kind of relation would, is he going to have with India? Um, I think there's, 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 there's room, even if he's partly dependent on pro-Taliban or quasi-Taliban, crypto-Taliban warlords. I mean, I'm sort of totally speculating here, but I don't see why there, there couldn't be the kind of pragmatic relationship based pretty much on uh, strategic gain that, um, from the Afghan perspective, that other Afghan governments have had with Delhi and with other uh, states in the region. Um, you know, again, a variable is Pakistan, but more recently we've seen Pakistan nuancing their attitudes, looking slightly more, slightly more positive, uh, constructive, starting from a pretty low base, but nonetheless. So I think um, Delhi will not get the warmth that it would like from any Afghan leader, uh, but I don't see necessarily uh, a, 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 a profoundly hostile regime in Kabul um, in the next, from the Delhi point of view, in the, in the immediate future. Beyond that, I don't know, and Ed will no doubt immediately <laughs> raise the issue of Najibullah, who lasted three years and then was deposed, and the Taliban took power, and he fell because nobody paid his army, basically. The Soviets couldn't pay for his army. So that is a massive unknown at the moment. Um, but, I mean, I would stick my neck out and say, but for three or four years, I don't think, I, I think it's pretty unlikely you're going to have a profoundly hostile regime um, in, in Kabul for the moment. Uh, a gentleman here. Hello? Oh, sorry. Hi, can I, can I skip the queue? Okay. Um, are going through a transition. Recently, there was a flare-up on Indo-Pak border. The Pakistani Foreign Minister, Hina Rabbani Khar, was quite on the point, but the many Indians sitting here have not studied it fully. Afghans are resentful of foreign forces, and they have displayed it forcefully. And Whatever you have stated, Taliban are not going to take over in Afghanistan once the foreign forces leave. But still, number of mistakes are being committed by uh, U.S. forces, U.S. and uh, our pa partners. The Afghans don't need three. For example, this khap and we read a lot in media, in paper. Same is the situation of Afghanistan. Thank you. Can we get... The question is that, my, not question, my answer. Once the Americans leave, Taliban are not going to take over. Leave them to Afghans. They will solve it. Shall we get the next question and then we can have our... Yes. <laughs> 
Okay? Yeah. Uh, my question is to Jason. Uh, talking about the 80s war when the Afghans fought against the Russians, uh, do you think that if that war would have been fought under the banner of Afghan nationalism rather than Islamic Mujahideen collected from Kosovo to Philip? As Lou, uh, I don't know whether, could you get something? Yeah, go on. Uh, uh, should I repeat? This is more a question. This is yeah, uh, uh, my question is, uh, if the it is war of the of Afghan war, if that war would have been fought under the banner of Afghan nationalism rather than Islamic Mujahideen collected from Kosovo to Philippines against the faithless and communist Russians. And as Lucy said, that again there was some windows of opportunity in 2001 that we lost. And what is going to happen after 2014? Well, Ed was actually there <laughs> during the 80s, so he's probably best <laughs> qualified to talk about well, it. Well, first of all, I mean, th there was, in a sense, a, a nationalistic element when the Soviets invaded. That was not the case. I mean, the war actually began in, in mid-1978 uh, when the insurgency began to, to uh, rebel against the, 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 the government, which was actually trying to impose various reforms which would actually go down quite well today. Uh, but the way it was done at the time was, was abrasive. And, um, but the moment I think the Soviets invaded, uh, then this whole Islamic element strengthened because it was perceived as being an anti-religious uh, invasion by foreign force. So all these elements came into being. And, and I think the extraordinary thing about Islam as well, which uh, was actually, and still is quite impressive, is that whether you are the poorest man, little farmer, uh, or you know, shepherd, uh, and a wealthy landowner, uh, under the eyes of Allah, you pray together, uh, and you're all equal. And I think this is something that a foreign ar army finds extremely dip difficult to counter. And in many ways as well, the same with the Taliban and the other uh, armed opposition today, uh, when you're dealing with, with a force or forces or fronts that Afghans understand but foreigners don't understand, then I think that the foreigner has lost, you know, ages ago. Um, so I think, you know, that is an element. But I, I can't see any sort of nationalistic sort of Afghan, united Afghanistan fighting against outside forces uh, emerging. I think it's very disparate. Lucy, do you want to make a comment and then we'll have to close them? Yeah, I wanted to come back on something that Jason said earlier about the when we went to Iraq, that there was a sort of sucking out of resources from Afghanistan. And I wanted to respectfully disagree with that, actually, because my belief uh, from the research that I've done is really that this war was lost in 2001, 2002 because of the failure of the political structure. It was nothing to do with resources, in my opinion. We've put plenty of resources in. Very few have reached the Afghans. I mean, we know the Americans have spent a trillion dollars on military operations. But this was really something that went back to what the CIA, um, I mean, and, and I hold them accountable in my book, um, that there was this peace plan for two years before 9-11, which all these factional leaders, including Massoud, had bought into where they had had meetings in Bonn and Istanbul, where you had people, and I've investigated uh, the people who were trying to get support in Washington, D.C. and in London, uh, both pre and around the time of 9-11, that uh, ultimately they were always prevented from doing so by the CIA. You know, even when people were interested in the White House, ultimately the buck stopped with the CIA. And no, there might have been people in the agency who had, had uh, sort of was slightly more um, attuned to the difficulties on the ground. Um, I think that there, were, there was a sort of overhang from the 1980s when the CIA was very close with the ISI, where most of their strategic direction came from the ISI because a lot of the agents were stuck in Islamabad and not able to travel, as, as Ed knows. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, that there was this kind of uh, dissing of, of Abdul Haq and, and sort of saying he's just Holly, Hollywood Haq. This is someone who speaks loud but doesn't deliver when in fact it was very much the opposite. Um, and just, you know, in relation to the confusion around that time, interestingly, the book by James Dobbins, the U.S. ambassador at the time of the Bonn Agreement, where he, he at, at the beginning of the book, gives a lot of um, 
thanks to CIA for, for their strategic direction. And then goes on, interestingly, to say that he was very surprised uh, by how the Bonn Agreement after the bombing of Kabul, after the fall of Kabul, that the Afghan, that particularly the Northern Alliance, were not willing to share power with the Pashtun. And to me, this goes to the heart of the sort of misunderstandings. This was a key reason why Abdul Haq wanted to take Kabul from the southeast at the same time uh, to have a much more equal political settlement. So I think we've totally failed to understand the context. Well, th thank you very much. Just as we have disagreement among our panelists, we have to close the panel. Sorry, can uh, I just squeeze one question in? Um, I think I'm going to say this on behalf of most people here. Um, everything we seem to know about Afghanistan, um, the political aspect of it, the social aspect of it, what people are trying to do there, um, not many of us have really had the privilege to go to the place and to really get a sense of what is actually going on. Why did the Americans go in there in the first place? Why did the Europeans join them um, in, in whatever their, their original agenda was? Um, I lived in Ireland, uh, it's a small country just south of England, um, and I happened to chance upon a writer called Dovla Murphy. Uh, I'm not sure if you are aware of her. Um, she undertook a journey from Ireland to India on bicycle and um, uh, and she wrote a journal she maintained a journal and she basically wrote um, about her daily experiences and uh, when she put it together as a book which was a bestseller in 1962 uh, the essence of her story was Afghanistan the land the spirit of the land what it stood for and what she experienced as a white person in 1962 before the Soviets came in before any of this anti-insurgency before uh, Islam was an issue um, if I can try and get a bigger picture of Afghanistan, the land, have we really lost that concept of Afghanistan as a land? I is it really divided for good? Will it never be the same as it used to be in 1962? Because what she wrote about uh, was, you know, she, she, wrote, she gave a bigger picture of what Afghan people really stand for. Uh, she talked about dignity, she talked about the right interpretation of Islam. Uh, there's one beautiful um, incident when she said she passed out, she was on a bicycle, she ran out of food stock and she passed out in the middle of a desert and when she woke up she had a makeshift tent over her, her head you know somebody had just sort of built a tent over her head just to protect her from the sunlight and she had a flask of water next to her uh, so that that really i mean uh, the end the discussion about politics and about military and it's really just endless we, none of us really know what's going on but i want to go out there and i want to document the human story of afghanistan uh, if you talk about I mean, have many people really attempted that? There's the likes of Tim Hetherington, who got killed uh, last year in Afghanistan while trying to do that. Uh, there's the likes of um, uh, Livingstone, who in the 1850s, he was on the pursuit of India. He wrote about that. So what is really the human story of Afghanistan? And can we really ever recapture that? Can we get back in touch with the spirit of the land? Is that really possible? Or is it Afghanistan really just a political and military issue? I is there such a thing? anymore? Um, are we just living in dreams? Can we, um, maybe each of you can say something very, very briefly about, it's actually a very important point, and it goes back to the point I made about the poetry and the uh, sentimental language of Afghan, uh, Afghan Ness. Well, I'm going to be very unsentimental. Um, I don't think that reading books written in 1962 are a very good guide to any contemporary country I wouldn't read V.S. Naipaul about India back then and think he was telling me a great deal about what is India today, or indeed read equivalent authors from my own country. I think there's a great danger in romanticizing uh, societies and peoples and cultures, and that what we need to engage with now is a contemporary Afghanistan with contemporary movements very much involved in mo the modern world, exposed to influences of the modern world in 2013, 2014, rather than look to what may well have been a fairly mythic idea of Afghanistan 50 or 60 years ago. I, I still think, I mean, I, I feel that what's very important is the idea of unity and uh, the, the, the Afghanistan is so divided and, and in fact we've really helped that to become much more the case in the last 10 years. I mean many of these warlords of course have receiving money from outside whether it's Saudi Arabia or whether it's us. Um, but I think you know really to, to achieve some sort of national unity I do think that the culture and the history is very important and that's why I think projects like the projects of the Aga Khan 
is undertaking to restore Baba's gardens and old parts of the city. I think that's very, very vital for people to sort of find some sort of sense of national identity um, around which they can coalesce to bring peace. I mean, I, I, I'm a romantic, and, but I, I don't think I romanticize Afghanistan, although it, you know, even as a journalist and a writer, I, I'm deeply attached to the Afghans and Afghanistan, and I've seen many parts of the country by foot, um, and which is much more difficult to do today. And I, f I find this very, very frustrating. Um, I mean, I tried in 2004, 2005 to revisit quite a few of the areas I'd been to before by foot, but actually going in the other way by car, then walking. It was much more difficult. Uh, people, I mean, when I knew people, they would tell the others, oh, he was here during the jihad period. He came in by foot. Uh, this made a difference. But I think it's very difficult today for anyone, particularly if they've come in recently, to even get out and see this Afghanistan, which I was able to, to see, and as, as um, you know, was, was pointed out, the fact that the war has changed so much, and you're looking at a very fatigued, very tired population, and a very abused and traumatized population as well. And the fact that everyone else seems to know so much better than the Afghans what to do with Afghanistan. Uh, you know, regardless whether you're Chinese, Indian, American, European, it doesn't matter. And whether Afghans themselves not know what to do is also a big question. I mean, there is uh, an expression that we've often used in jest that, you know, you, you can always rent an Afghan, but you can never buy him, meaning that Afghans will change sides as often as, as the light changes. Not so much uh, because for themselves, but what's good for their own community, their families. And that's why you'll always have changing allegiances. And what will probably happen as well is that uh, the Taliban or the, the opposition will make deals with the Afghan army, the Afghan police. It's already happening. Uh, I mean, the rule of thumb is that when you drive down the road after 2 o'clock, say down to Jalalabad, and there's a police checkpoint, your first question is, are they now pro-Talib or not? Uh, so, I, you know, it's, it's very difficult. And even for Afghans themselves, there are many Afghans in Kabul who don't know their country. And that's one of the problems. Well, with that, um, please join me in thanking all our speakers uh, for this extraordinary panel. Many thanks to all the eminent speakers for the most riveting session. Thank you very much.